Well, it's been our joy this week to uh, welcome Emma Stark, who has set up the Glasgow Prophetic Center. She leads a church up in Glasgow as well. And she has been for the last few days spending time with our team, just speaking to the last, speaking to my life uh, prophetically. And uh, the prophetic is meant to stir us, challenge us, provoke us. And um, she's done plenty of that the last few days. And uh, we are so grateful to God for her. So I'd like you to open your heart and give a massive, massive welcome to Emma now as she comes to bring God's word. Thank you very much. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Family? Good. It's a real joy to be with you, and um, greetings from our church in Glasgow and from Glasgow Prophetic Centre. I've got Sam with me. Sam, do you want to jump up and give a wave? He works full time. He's a prophet. In fact, Sam, shall we just shall we just prophesy? Do you want to grab the mic? Why don't you start us off? Let's pick some victims. I mean, some victims. Not at all. Uh, this young guy here in the green, yourself. Yeah, do you want to stand to your feet? What's your name? Josh, I'm going to give you a new name anyway. Josh, the Spirit of the Lord says this to you. Son, I call you a Samuel. And the Lord says, I've called you once and I've spoken to you twice. But the Lord says, this is the third time. And he says, you are waking up to the reality that I have called you as a man who will preach and prophesy to your generation. And the Spirit of the Lord says this to you. Son, there is a call to stand in employment. But the Lord says, there is also a call to be a voice to the millennial generation and to speak on things of purity and to speak of things of living holy and blameless. And the Spirit of the Lord says this to you, I will put you on platforms and you will share your own story of how you came to be pure and how you came to run into my arms. And the Lord says, it will be a sword that I bring down on the millennial spirit and how it has polluted your generation. And the Spirit of God says that in this third call, as you wake up to the reality. He says that that critical spirit that sits at your side, that whispers in your ear to try and trip you up. He says, from this moment on, I am dealing with and I am removing. And the Spirit of God says this to you, son, I have made you for signs, for wonders, and for miracles. And the Lord says, the power that Samuel knew when he spoke, the Lord says, so you will know. And the Lord says this, son, you're going to have words that you speak into your family. And the Lord says, the discourse and the tension in your family, the Lord says, will bow and will be removed. And the Lord says that you will have a word, he says, like Jesus had to the wind and the waves, where you say, peace, be still. And he says, what the enemy brought of disruption and disconnection and tense family relationships will remain no longer. And he says, yes, I will visit your generation, but first I'm visiting visiting you and I'm visiting your house. So in Jesus' name, we just bless you as a Samuel for your generation, but also as a Samuel for your family. This lady in front of me here, what's your name, my lovely? Angela. Angela, do you want to jump to your feet? Nice to meet you, Angela. And I heard the Spirit of the Lord say this. I'm going to, actually I'm going to come and lay my hands on you, if that's okay. Yeah. Oh, high heels and steps. Right, right, right. Okay. And I heard the Spirit of the Lord say this to you, daughter, thank you for the years of intercession and prayer. For the Lord says, truly you have held the doors open in heaven that I may pour my glory down on the many, says the Lord. But the Lord says to you, I am now taking that off your body that has slowed you down and even been an infirmity. And you have wept before me and you have felt even an aging before your time. And the Lord says, right now I am putting glory fire on you that you may run and not grow weary, that you will walk and not faint. And the Lord says, I'm going to give you back a vitality and an energy. But the Lord says, I have been waking you up in the night and you thought it was just poor sleep, didn't you? But the Lord says, actually, I've been deliberately poking you in the night that you might be the intercessor of the watches of the night. And the Lord says, if you will pray during the night as I have woken you, the Lord says, you will not have the energy deficiency in the afternoon that you currently 
currently have for the Lord says I have given you the Job anointing to shake the wickedness out of the day before it dawns and do you remember that's in Job that there's a dawn watch and I feel like your waking hours are just before dawn uh, aren't they and the Lord is saying to you that that is why and the Lord says grab hold of the region for I am giving you not just authority over your family to pray which you've done for years but the Lord says I am giving you authority over the region and the territory says God and the Lord says do you remember how stubborn you used to be and the Lord's your husband's going oh yes and uh, uh, but there has been a softening of it over the years and the Lord says I want to give you the force of your stubbornness back your husband's like oh Jesus make her stop talking uh, but the Lord is saying to you <laughs> bless him but the Lord is saying your fight has turned down and the Lord says I am giving you back the force that you knew says God even vocally and the Lord says I am giving you back an ability to grab hold of things and pull them down for the Lord says I am calling you Jeremiah in this hour for you thought to be accepted you only had to say nice things and build up but the Lord says the Jeremiah anointing also knows what to tear down that is wrong and so the Lord says you are going to be one who, who starts to destroy the works of the enemy and the Lord says no longer do I want you to pray that you would be meek for the Lord says to you did I not say in scripture that we were to be as innocent as doves but as shrewd as serpents and the Lord says your shrewdness and even your biblical serpentness where you can strike the enemy is coming upon you says the Lord so I bless you as a national intercessor in Jesus name amen Whoa. aren't there some weird verses in scripture which one of you prays I'd like to be innocent like a dove does anybody ever pray the second half of that I'd like to be shrewd like a snake I mean that's scripture isn't it okay I heard the Spirit of the Lord ask the question over this church, who are you? And there was such a sense of the Lord speaking with a force that the Lord was saying to you, I want you to drop even the visions and even the personal visions that you have had and even the ideas of how some things are to go. For the Spirit of the Lord says, it is bigger than you have asked and I am redefining you in this hour and I am giving you a new language for who you are, says God. And so I'm actually going to preach differently from how I preached this morning in the first service because I feel like the Lord is saying, that there has been even a lack of fight and a lack of understanding of the fullness of your authority. And so when God says, who are you? The temptation right now is to answer that in a lower way than actually God is saying. So I'm going to teach you on believer's authority because I believe that's the corporate word to this church. And that at the end of today, you are going to leave knowing how powerful you are say powerful in an Irish accent, powerful. <laughs> and how mighty you are. And you see your low grade opinion of yourself and your low self-esteem and even one or two of you who partner with self-hatred, the Lord says that is going to go out the door this morning and you are going to form a new army this morning, says the Lord. For the Lord says it is the end of the days of just being those who follow without a battle formation. For the Lord says I am bringing you together under your leader as the general in command that you may take a military formation and the Lord says this is the days of the army of the Lord in Exeter moving forward says God can you just open your hands we're going to pray oh father would you blow in and come and hover with your thick glory Clyde 
Oh, we welcome the intensity of your presence and the undoing of your love and even the force of your whirlwind. That Nahum one wind of God. And Father, we welcome the glory, Clyde, and the kabod and the weight that you are to start to settle in our midst. And Lord, we pray like Jeremiah that you would start to write your truth in our hearts, that you would indelibly mark our insides, that right now you would come with such determination, God, that we would be those who end the cycles of boom and bust and boomerang and backslide and that Father right now you would set us on a trajectory of those who only know glory to glory and in the name of Jesus I break your cycles yay God I ask that there would no longer be A people here who are tossed about by every passing wind and wave. But Father, right now that you would strengthen them as they sit in the pews. In Jesus' name, amen. How does our king rule? Our God has all power and authority. And our God gives us power on this side, which is capacity. And he gives us authority on this side, which is the right. You need to remember those two things. So apart from God, we are the only beings in the cosmos with over here, which was authority, which is the right. Okay, and over here we have angels who have power. In other words, they have the capacity to do things, but they have no authority, which is the right. Okay, and because they're not created in the image of God, so they turn up and then they get a little bit of authority over here when they are asked to do the next thing that God wants them to do. And when an angel who sits over here with power and the capacity starts to walk across and grab authority, that doesn't go so well. And that ends up being Satan. So angels don't have authority unless sent. They only have power. God doesn't use demons. Where would a demon get its authority from? You. You and I. That's it. God doesn't send them to do anything. He doesn't uh, use them. Sometimes a demon will show up at the throne room of God and God acknowledges that they exist and he asks them what they're up to and they will say that they are looking for people on the earth who will cooperate with them and add to their capacity authority. It is still only God and humans who have power and authority. So what level of power and authority do you have? How much do you have? See, Matthew 28, 18 says, Jesus came to them and gave them all authority in heaven and earth. So you have all power and all authority authority and if you've got all of it it means somebody else has none of it okay tell your neighbor you have power and authority say it with an Irish accent it'll help And so when Roman 8 turns up, Romans 8 turns up and it says, you are more than a conqueror. Don't you think that's a bit strange that it's a very odd phrase? Wouldn't you just like to be a conqueror? Wouldn't you just like to be an overcomer? What on earth does it mean to be more than a conqueror? 
Let me give you a tennis analogy. Andy Murray, my absolute uh, hero in the tennis world, my favorite sport, is a conqueror because he's won Wimbledon twice and Olympic gold medals and the uh, American Open. He has defeated Novak Djokovic and, and Roger Federer and Rafa Nadal. And Andy gets paid the check and it's a big one. And the check gets cashed and his wife, Kim, goes to Selfridges and and she buys Prada and Gucci. And Andy Murray is the hero and the conqueror, but his wife is more than a conqueror. And she lives out of the blessing of the victorious place. And you don't have to fight like Jesus did. You get the easy part of knowing how to apply the winnings. You are more than a conqueror. The foe is defeated and the Spirit of the Lord is asking this church today, what are you going to do with the victory that you already have? In other words, how are you going to spend your favor? So if I say to you, church, what's the list personally and corporately of how you're going to spend your favor? Some of you shout out to me how you're going to spend your favor. Blessing others. Blessing others. Healing. Healing. New buildings. Come on. How about, okay, God, if we have all authority and you're telling me to spend my favor, that I don't just say, oh, God, let the building kind of manifest, but I say, let an architect and a financier of billions come and turn up in the door and offer to underwrite it and an architect who will do the plans for free. You see, that that is knowing I have all authority and all power and knowing how I need to ask to spend my favor. Is a different thought process than a small thinking, okay? And the foe is defeated and you get to declare the victory with single words of decree because at the name of Jesus, everything else has got to buy and his name is a torment to all the powers of darkness. And you stand today in the limitless power of the resurrection. Say limitless. There is no cap on your life or your church unless you believe there is, unless you put one in. And the kingdom of God is so big, the sky is so big that no two birds collide. There is room for everybody to come up and be a success. And whenever I have phone calls with small-minded people and there's empire building and there's jealousy and competition, I slam the phone down and I shout at the phone, oh, Oh, you do not understand the limitlessness of the kingdom of God. And I feel that the Lord wants to infuse you this morning with the concept of his limitless kingdom and the fact that you are more than a conqueror and you need to start to ask for some bigger things and to decree something more extravagant and not to stay in the low grade small place because a greatness was bestowed on you by the resurrection of Jesus. Let's go to Genesis for this journey of authority and power. It says God makes things after their kind. He made trees after their kind. What kind? Tree kind. It's not complicated, okay? He makes insects after their kind. What kind? Insect kind. He makes sheep after their kind. What kind? Sheep kind. And God duplicates the DNA and the gene pull of heaven on the earth. And he says, ooh, that's good. And he ticks off the list. You see that bird? That's great. That bird on earth matches the bird in heaven. And then he says, let us make mankind in our image, in the God kind image. And he makes everything else after its kind, just as it is with us. But we're a little bit of anomaly because he makes us 100% like God and 100% like 
man. But he calls us three times in scripture, God's little g, small g. Twice in Psalm 82 and once in John 10, verse 34. Every one of you, according to scripture, is a little God. And we have to understand the bigness of who God has made us to be. And Genesis 1 goes on and he says, I'm going to give you dominion. And that means you're going to rule and you're going to reign and you're going to dominate. And I'm going to make you a king. And I'm going to give you a domain. And when you stay in this domain, you're the king of the domain. And this soil, this earth is where you rule. Now tell me, what was the domain that was given to Adam? It wasn't just Eden, it was the whole earth. Adam was the king of the domain of the earth. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are a king. That was, that was quite pathetic. I actually tell my children I'm the queen of Ireland. I don't know for how much longer I'm going to get away with that. But anyway, turn to, your, <laughs> turn to your other neighbor and say, you are a king like they really are. You are a king. Psalm 105 verse 16. The heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to mankind. And when God says let them have dominion in, in Genesis 1, 26. Once he speaks that, he exempts himself. And he has given meaningful responsibility to man with the skill to rule. And so God is the king of kings, us. He is the Lord of lords, us. We are landlords, not just landlords, we are world lords. We own the whole world. Now you know what King of Kings and Lord of Lords means. And he's got the whole world in his hands is a childhood song of heresy. Because we have the whole world in our hands. He has given authority to you. And when God came to Adam and he brought him the animals and, animal, and, and Adam's got to name them, why will God not name the animals? Because Adam is the king of the domain and he watches over Adam to see if he will name them as they are in heaven. And I think it's a bit of a test and Adam says, oh, that's a lion. And God looks at him and says, oh, well done, son, that is a lion. You're just like me. And God said, kangaroo, Adam said, kangaroo. And God said, oh, you're perfect. That is a kangaroo. And then God does something phenomenal. God comes to Adam in, in the verse 28 of Genesis 1. And he says, you be fruitful. You multiply. You have dominion. You subdue. And he says, be fruitful, not do fruitful. So I want to say to you this morning, dominion is not what you do. It is who you are. You are a prince. You are the king of the world. It is who you are by the design of God. It is not what you have to pray and fast to work up to. It is already given to you at the moment of salvation. And then God says, I will bless them. And the word to bless is the word barak. So what do you think the word barak means in the original Hebrew? To bless. Nobody's brave enough to talk to me. Okay, it is a bit of a trap, you're right. It means I will kneel down. I will salute. I will adore on bended knee. And God comes down to the earth realm and he leaves his domain and he comes to Adam's domain and God kneels down and salutes and blesses Adam. And God came 
to the king of the domain and he knew he needed to teach all of earth's creatures what they had to do when they saw Adam. And God barracks Adam and creation looks and says, who is man that you are mindful of him? And all creation barracks Adam. And in the New Testament, Jesus having all power over the enemy, he stoops and he washes the disciples' feet. And Peter says, oh no, don't you bend down, Jesus. That's such a lowly thing to do. But Jesus is once again showing the devil the power and the place of man in creation. Come on, you can get a bit excited. You look absolutely stunned. And God barracks Adam because protocol says, when I am in someone else's kingdom, I lay down my crime. It is why scripture says, when you get to heaven and you get to the king's domain, you're going to cast your crime down. And God barracks and he confers honor on Adam. And as long as you are on the earth, you are going to have dominion. I'm glad two of you are with me. <laughs> Why was Lucifer in the garden? He was already there. Ezekiel 28 says, you were in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone adorned you. Eden belonged to Lucifer, according to scripture, before it belonged to us. It was the place where he owned. It was where all the kings of the heavenly realms had seen him sent. Let me read to you Ezekiel 28, 17. So I threw you to earth and I made a spectacle of you before kings and by your many sins and dishonest trades, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. So I made a fire come out from you and it consumed you and I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. And all of heaven had watched Satan burn from the inside out. Now why fire? Because you read in Ezekiel 28 that Lucifer, Satan, had been in charge of the sacred, holy, fiery stones of heaven. The ones that you read about in Isaiah 6 where the seraphim take the fiery coals. And God sends him down and burns him with fire from the inside out. And what Satan had been a custodian of, it destroyed him in the face of all of the rulers in heaven and earth. And God could not undo his word that that that's where Lucifer was to be. And God's word is irrevocable and it doesn't return void. And your gifts and your callings are irrevocable. God gives you a gift and he cannot take it back. And he cannot break his word regarding Lucifer. So he makes someone else in his own image who did not make that promise. And he says, you be fruitful and you multiply and you make sure you subdue. And by the way, you get that snake under your feet. And so Lucifer has a plan all his days to say, I want to be like Adam, who is like God. And he's saying, you come on, you give away your authority. You give away your favor to me. You get distracted and you think small and you don't go into the fullness of your destiny because I want what you've got. Where does Satan come from? A third of the angels, you know, set up a coup and fought Michael and his angels. You read that in the book of Jude. And does Michael turn to God and say, hey, God, I think I'm going to need some help here. Aren't you going to help me? And God doesn't fight Lucifer. He gives Michael the power to rebuke him. And remember, Lucifer at that point is the second highest in all of heaven. So Michael is firing his boss. And Michael dare not slander him. God does not fight Michael because gods don't fight angels. It's why at the end of time, it's an angel who casts Satan into the abyss, not God himself. 
Read that in Revelation. It would break protocol. If God fought the rebellious angels, it would make them think they were equals. It wouldn't be a fair fight. Angels fight angels. And there is a protocol in heaven. And everybody has a spiritual rank. And Satan is terrified of your high rank and every demon in the world knows that you are a king it is just you who hasn't realized it and when you start to get hold of the fact that you have all power and authority the number of healings and miracles will shoot up in this place the number of breakthroughs will start to come to this house because you are a co-heir with Christ and you are seated at the right hand of God the Father and it is time for the world to know who you are and it is time for you to manifest as the kings not just of Devon but even of the wider region and counties in England for you are the church who has been given dominion it is time for the sick to stand in front of you with demons jumping and pain all over them and unforgiveness in their heart and generational curses attached to them and for you to know who you are. It is time for the demonic to know your name and to take note when you turn up because you have not blinked in the face of their schemes because you know who you are. It is time for a mind transformation so that your thinking starts to line up with all of heaven it is time church for a new level of glory to come to you because you know who you are Matthew 16 and I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church now the word in the Greek is the word ecclesia church ecclesia and the gates of Hades will not overcome it and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bind in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven and the word for church in our original text is the word ecclesia and ecclesia was first used by the Greeks as a word for their senate anybody ever heard a sermon on the ecclesia Okay, none of you. And that word means legislators or governors in the land. And when the Romans conquered the Greeks, they adopted this word but added a military aspect to it. So the ecclesia in Jesus' day was a specialized military task force that made things look Roman. So if a building doesn't look Roman, they would Romanize it. And this word meant to disciple a nation through warfare, education, legislation, government, family, and culture. They wanted to disciple a nation. They wanted to change the culture and the actions of a nation. They wanted it to look like, think like, and function like Rome. And so when Jesus rocks up in Matthew 16, and he says the word, I will build my Ecclesia, he is saying, I'm going to build a government on the earth and a group of spiritual legislators. You are the Ecclesia, you are the governing Senate in the earth. And our job is to make this land look like heaven. And God is calling his ecclesia at this time and saying, well, what are you going to do about the problems that the world face? Because you are my government. And let me say something wild. I believe that the church is the determining factor for what happens in a nation. And when the church is strong, the nation is strong. And the biggest demonic assignment is to talk the church out of being the church. And the church, let me tell you, whether we like it or not, is always leading in the nation. It's the prime leadership force. Because in Matthew 16, Jesus puts on the church the glory and the stewarding for governing a nation. And right now, we are using that anointing to lead by neglect 
And so when King James commissions the translation of the Bible that still bears his name in 1611, he had 15 conditions that were to be abided by. And one was that every time the word ecclesia, representing military legislation, governing assembly appeared, it was to be replaced by the word kyriakos. And kyriakos means belonging to the Lord. It's where we get the word kirk and then church. And kyriakos is a good word. It's a scriptural word, but it is not the right translation for Matthew 16. And King James did not want you or I to be a legislative body for understandable reasons. So we, for 400 years, subconsciously began to think of ourselves as a household and a family and never a government. And in Matthew 16, Jesus has taken his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. Now, it is at the foot of Mount Hermon. Anybody been there? A few of you, which you know is always snow-capped. It's the place where uh, the Mount of Transfiguration happened. A water runs down through the mountain and exits it as a stream. And Caesarea Philippi was hated by Orthodox rabbis. And it was taught, oh, no good Jew ever would go to Caesarea Philippi. And Mount Hermon is referred to as the Rock of the Gods in reference to the many shrines carved into its face to honor the gods. Shrines to Caesar and Pan, the god of Pandemonium, and the fertility goddess. And in the center of Caesarea Philippi, there is a cave called the Rock of the Gods. And this cave was called the Gate of Hades. It was the physical gate to the underworld in those days because it was believed that Baal would enter the underworld and enter the earth through the gate of Hades in Caesarea Philippi. And in first century Israel, Caesarea Philippi was the equivalent of Las Vegas, like a sin city capital, but much worse than our modern day American West City. And in an open air shrine, Next to this cave mouth, the worshippers of Pan would congregate and partake in bizarre sexual rituals with statues depicting these awful acts lining the cave. And in Caesarea Philippi, at the gate of Hades, the gods were worshipped in the most unspeakable ways. And so one day Jesus takes his 12 disciples, most likely all of whom were in their teens and early 20s, and he says, we're going to go to Caesarea Philippi. Why would Jesus choose this place, the place with the filthiest morals within walking distance of his earthly ministry? Might it be possible that he took his disciples to the most degenerate place possible to say to them, I am more powerful than any of this. And all that you see here is nothing in comparison to who I am and what can be done in my name. And when David, my husband, and I visited Caesarea Philippi about two years ago, I have to say I find it nearly impossible to hold my emotions in check. And with tears running down my face, I stood at the earthly mouth of the gates of hell. And perhaps the emotion was great because my son, my middle son is called Peter because of this scripture. But in that moment, I remembered that my parents had stood on that spot years before. And I remembered growing up in my father's church where my father had preached sermons for years about this scripture, where the truth that he had spoken had seat belted me in place for a wild journey with Jesus. And did the rocks remember what Jesus had said there? And were they crying out again for the mature sons of God to do business with this scripture? And I wondered if my mom was watching from heaven 
urging the truth of the words of my Savior that he had said in that place to go deeper still and not just to mark me or my father or my children, but mark a generation of believers that we might come forth to be all that he intended when he said, I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And I want you to go out to the places that make Caesarea Philippi look tame. And that is where I want you to build my church. And that is where you can build my church. And when Jesus uses that word Ecclesia, he is undoubtedly thinking about a legislative army. He is not talking about family or government or or building. He is talking about a government on the earth. And Jesus stands at the rock of the gods and he calls Peter the one on which he will build his church. And he calls you and he calls me the children who will see through our lives establish the legislative change that needs to come to shape a world. And I love the fact that this happens on Mount Hermon the transfiguration where Jesus just before had met Moses and Elijah on the same place in the sky and the prophet of Mount Sinai and the prophet of Mount Carmel had met Jesus on Mount Hermon and Moses who had stood down the Pharaoh and Elijah who had stood down the 450 prophets of Baal and Jesus stands at the earthly gates of hell and speaks concerning his upcoming confrontation with death and hell and he who is about to stand down the kingdom of darkness says I will so build you as a legislative government and that my kingdom will come and I'm about to tear down every stronghold of the enemy and I will give you all power and all authority and nothing will prevail against you. And come on, you are the ones, church in Exeter, who carry a governmental authority and a ruling anointing. I want to say to you, it is not about you getting by anymore. It is not about you surviving your history. It is not about surviving the flood. Right now, the Lord is birthing you into a place where you are going to start to command the winds and the waves. And when the waters start to rise, Jesus is saying to you, church, will you start to partner with a warfare decree rather than a petition? And will you open your mouth and will you speak to the wind and waves of this region? And will you tell them to be quiet and to back up? And the Lord is restoring to you an understanding that you are more than a family. You are that but you're the legislative ecclesia and he's gonna build on you and build on you and build on you. And you're the team of legislators. And the Lord says, today in this house, I want the enemy downsized in your eyes. For the Lord says, these are the days that you dreamed of. And God says, church, I am putting you back on track because you have not seen an expression of the government of God on the earth that you are about to see. And you are going to become one of the pioneering lead churches that will be the full expression of the kingdom of God. And everything is going to change. And I want to say to you, Satan has got a migraine at the thought of it all. And all of the tensions and all of the history and all of the uncertainty God says that was just the enemy playing games in this house because he was so terrified that not only were you legislators, but that you carry the lead pioneering mantle for the, for the county. The enemy is not leading. He is on the back foot and he is nervous of you and nervous that I am here. And we believe in destiny 
and we believe in helping Satan fulfill his destiny to be utterly destroyed and thrown into the lake of fire. <laughs> Jump to your feet, if you can. Whew. Let's raise our hands and let's repent. Oh, Father, you need to repeat after me. Father, we are so sorry where we downsized our authority. We want to partner with the truth that you have given us all power and authority. So let me just pray for you. Oh God, would you send your fire and would you burn their minds and would you burn out every low grade thought and would you burn out every small thought and would you burn out every thought that says that things cannot explode for good and for glory. And right now in the name of Jesus with your hands raised, come on, put your hands up church with me. I loose over you that you may grab hold of it in the atmosphere. A understanding and the revelation that you are the legislators, that you are the government, that all power and authority is yours. And so I loose the new mantle and the weight of the power of God back on you right now in Jesus' name. And the Lord would say to you, where you need a miracle, you can start to command it and it will come. And the Lord says to you, church in Exeter, who are you? Who are you? And the Lord says, do you know? Do you know what I call you? So I bless you. From a warrior with Celtic blood that you may arise and be the church for this hour the pioneers without fear and builds and builds and builds and builds. Let me release one more anointing that God has just whispered in my ear about. Keep standing. You know David, King David, not my husband David, King David, he wants to build, doesn't he? He has a vision to build, but he can't because he doesn't have authority to do it. He's got authority to fight. He makes war with everybody. And that man must have been so frustrated holding the vision of a building that he had no authority to build. And it wasn't until a Solomon, a Solomonic anointing came. And Solomon was the builder. And he had the authority to build in a way his dad did not the temple. And I feel like the Lord is saying, release the Solomonic anointing and end the days of frustration where you have been like David's who could see it, but not like Solomon's who could build it. Raise your hands, my lovelies, okay? In the name of Jesus, I loose to you a Solomonic anointing and I end the days of just having a vision and I release to you the authority authority to build right now, not just the notion of it, but that what you now do will gain a traction like never before. And the Lord says, it is your time to birth and it is your time to build. And the Lord says, there will be new media. There will be albums, says God. There will be the birthing and the building of a studio. And the Lord says, your albums of war 
war will go out across the face of the globe. And the Lord says, you will resurrect a generation of warriors by your sign, says the Lord. And the Lord says, you will birth and build books and you will birth and build incubators for kingdom business, says the Lord. And the Lord says, I am raising up in this house kingdom financiers who will microfinance business. Oh, that's going to be you and some others. And the Lord says to you, I am going to start to catapult you into destiny because today you got written on your heart like Jeremiah, an understanding of who you are that cannot be taken away. And the Lord says, birth and build, birth and build. Amen. I haven't got a clue how to follow that. <laughs> I haven't got a clue. There's, um, we recorded the first session because there were very specific prophetic words that uh, Emma just spoke over the church very directly. And, uh, and we as leadership team will be going over that and we will be responding to God on all of those points and if there are areas we need to repent we'll do that if there are areas we need to decide on we'll do that because um, we've invited the prophetic into our midst because they're part of God's plan to stimulate and to mobilize the people of God into the destiny and the purpose God has for us we'll, we'll send that recording or we'll, we'll put it on our website and our app and I want to ask all of you to, to listen to it because it's a different word to what came in the second service. And I want to invite you into that journey because there's something very, very powerful that God is saying to us. It'll take about 50 minutes of your time to really get over that the first time. And then you want to listen again. And you want to listen again. And the same with this word in the second service. You'll want to re-listen and write it down. And to, but let it be more than information. Let it be revelation to you. Come on, guys. This is time now for the church to rise. This is time to move away from our frustrations. We haven't seen anything yet of what God is going to do. We haven't seen it yet. I was, I was at our National Leaders Conference a few weeks ago. And uh, people, because of social media, they see things that are going on here. And one of the comments I had regularly from other pastors was things seem to be going really well in Exeter. And I, I, you know, and I don't know how to respond to this because in my heart, I'm thinking, in fact, I said this to a few people, there are more people shopping Sainsbury's in one hour than are a part of the church in this area. Come on, it's not that good, is it? God, please, please revive your church. Please, God, capture the heart of a nation. Please, God. And we've heard this morning that God is saying, please, church. I'm saying, please, God. And He's saying, please, church. I'm saying, come on, God. And He's saying, come on, church. All authority has been given already. Therefore, go. Go. Let's pray. verse in the scriptures that says that the eye of the Lord is roaming the earth to find someone who will go. He's looking around this room now and saying, who, who will stand up? Who will rise in my authority and power? Who will do it? And if your response is, God, I pray you give the leaders courage to do that. You've missed it, my friend. Because he's looking at you. He's looking at me as well, but he's looking at you. What does, he, what does he hear back? Who are you? What's he hearing back from you? What's the response of your heart? God, whatever, whatever, whatever it costs, 
Whatever it takes, whatever it changes, whatever it provokes, whatever God. Amen. Father, we've heard your word this morning. And we don't want to be hearers and not doers. Father, is someone you've called with the privileged position of being able to lead on your behalf this church and be a, an understudy, I hope a faithful understudy of your leadership. Father, I just publicly declare I want in. I want to rise up in my authority and my power. I don't want to lead out of apathy. I don't want to lead out of formality. I don't want to lead out of what has been. Father, I want to see your kingdom come on this earth. And I just consider it important just to declare that before you, the church. I'm in. Are you? Will you join me? Will you join us? Whatever it takes. Just let your prayer now be a response. And whatever decisions you know you need to make this week, there are some of you very immediately, you know there are some things you need to go and reorder and rechange. Just make a decision now. Don't think, I hope I'll change that. You're going to change it. You're going to change it. You're going to leave this place. You're going to change it. Stop waiting. Move into it. So Father, as the army of God, as the people of God commissioned, we declare together that you have blessed us, you have positioned us, you have authorized us, and you have commissioned us, and you have sent us, and our hearts say, yes, God. Yes, God. Come on, just let that be. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes to you, O oh God. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.